There's nothing like a good hunting story to make your dinner guest duck out faster than a booner jumping the bowstring. Every hunt is a story to tell. Whether it's your first hunt or you have decades under your belt, every step into the woods yields an experience unique to that time, day, and season. I'm your host, Derek DeBoer, and here are a few of our hunting stories. You know, one of the things that's really fascinating to me when you're talking to somebody or listening to somebody talk about their deer hunting experience is when a hunter can pattern a deer or or have experience with the deer years prior to them actually shooting the deer. It's always been kind of a neat trick. I haven't had really that specific experience except but one time and it was after the fact that I put all the pieces together. It was a really fun hunt and set of circumstances that led up to it. And it's the only deer that I have a shoulder mount of. In fact, it's the only deer any of my family, immediate family, has a shoulder mount of. And it's just because it's such a unique deer and has such a story behind it. So this buck, he's really, he's got a unique rack in that his his one beam droops down and must have been a result of an injury in velvet or something like that. Something affected his rack. He's a really old deer. In fact, he's got a... I've had him shoulder mounted, but he's really a poor looking mount, to be honest, because he's such an old deer, and he had such a ratted up hide. His neck was all torn up, and he's got such a old white face. He really makes a poor mount, as far as that's concerned. But that's really one of the reasons that maybe their only reason that I elected to spend the money on a shoulder mount because he had the old white recognizable face from the season that I took him and just wanted to preserve that old old deer so I'm pretty pleased with it overall because of the story behind it this was in 2010 I believe and I had a basically I had two encounters with this deer the first one was earlier in archery season my brother and I are primarily archery hunters and we were out let's see this would have been my last year in college well I'd have graduated that previous spring in 2010 so things were kind of up in the air and and probably well, I can't remember exactly how that archery season went. But ordinarily, we'd get out a little bit in October, not see a whole lot, and then by the time November rolls around, the rut gets kicking, and we begin to see some action. And my first experience was in early November with this buck, early to mid-November. We had a stand that we used to call the short stand, and it was the original ladder stand that dad had built a homemade steel tube frame one inch steel tubing welded together with a ladder and a platform at the top the original platform it, the stand was configured in an L shape so about a 10 foot ladder with the platform at the top that extends back to the tree where it's secured and it had a plywood platform I believe and then as time went on as we began to archery hunt we needed a place to stand up on that stand because dad had been rifle hunting up to that point and now that we were archery hunting we needed a seat on top of that 
platform so that we could sit down for extended periods and then stand up, draw, and take our shot. So we modified that stand with small steel tubing, extended the seat up, kind of a rectangular seat on top of that platform. And then I believe the platform we replaced with some of that smaller steel tubing as well. So a small spot to stand with a little metal platform on top as a seat. And we moved the stand from its original location, kind of down in the bottom, in the creek bottom, on a big locust tree, to a hackberry tree along a spot that now we call Deer Canyon, a spot that we have shot the majority of our bucks from. They kind of crisscross through this location, moving east to west along kind of a bench at the bottom of the hill before it drops back down into the bottom. And then north-south is a ravine that goes up into the native pasture. So they'll either cross down through that ravine coming from the north or south or head east or west and sometimes they'll change direction there. So it's a good crossroads at that particular point. So we move the stand there and you're facing east out of that stand with a big grass pasture behind you that's really open to your left or to the north would be kind of the open timber of the creek bottom and then on your right hand side to the south are thick cedar trees that go on the hillside up to the native grass pasture and it's just really thick off to your right and to the front and it's common for does and deer to kind of filter out through those cedar trees they'll often bed up on the top of the hill or on the crest right along the top in those cedar trees and then they'll drop down through the cedars into the bottom to feed and make their way throughout the day so you're commonly kind of looking and focusing on those cedar trees watching for any movement that's the spot that you often get caught because they can sneak through those cedar needles on the ground very quietly you won't hear them crunch through the leaves and they can sneak up on you pretty quickly so a fairly typical november morning very nice and cool crisp and felt really really nice to be out sitting in the tree stand and you're facing the sun a little bit but you're shaded by the trees so you can watch the sun come up and by the time the sun fully rises that's usually when the deer activity is in full swing. And anything can happen in those spots. There's typically scrapes along that bench that runs east and west and down into the bottom. And you'll often see does. Back then, actually, the population of deer was quite a bit higher than what it is now. And it'd be common to see 10 to 20 does in their fawns combined running through those locations. Well, right after the sun had come up, it was just kind of peeking up through the treetops, the does started to filter down from my right-hand side. And I caught the ac activity there, and, and so that distracted me and started watching those deer. And you're aware that anything can happen when there's does around. There's sure to be bucks checking them out. So you start to get ready, and start to be a little bit more aware but it's such a thick area in that particular location that deer can come from anywhere so you kind of you don't want to produce too much movement but your head's kind of on a swivel because you're looking behind you you're listening to the right and left you're just trying to soak it all in so that nothing gets past you nothing sneaks up and everything can happen really quickly so i remember standing up so that i would be ready to get my bow down off the hook and get ready for a shot if I needed to. And the deer crossed from the east side of Deer Canyon, that draw, kind of to moving toward the west hand side. So I was slowly moving around, slowly moving around, and just focusing on the bulk of the deer. They kind of spread out throughout the hillsides and it gets a little bit difficult to keep track of everything. And that's usually when the does bust you. They spread out and then you make the wrong move and one of them's staring right at the stand and they'll blow and bust you out of there. So I was focusing on the does, and out of the corner of my eye, some movement 
caught my eye from the east and so I kind of slowly pivot over there and all I saw at that point was a white face moving down through the trees following these does the same path that they'd gone and immediately you think oh it's an old deer and a single old deer that's got to be a buck and if he's that old that he's got that white face he's a shooter no matter what so you I immediately started getting in position to shoot where I thought he would come out into a clearing. Kind of had some shooting lanes and open spots cleared out around that stand. Just naturally there's some older uh, deciduous trees, some hackberries and locusts that kind of opened up over time and created some openings. So you get ready to watch him enter into one of those locations well being that old of a deer and he's slightly higher than I would be in elevation because he's coming down that hillside and basically eye level at that point well he catches my movement and he freezes stock still like an old deer will and it's just it feels like for ages he's just standing there and then like they'll do they don't bust out they just simply turn and move away and I watched him go up the hill and at that point, the identifying features of that deer was just its really white old face. And then I could see that beam kind of droop off on one side. And that's about all the character I could tell from that encounter. But he moved off to the south and up over the hill, and that was the last of it. And I, of course, was deflated. You'd hate to see that happen, and you know that it was your mistake. And it was probably my movement trying to get a angle kind of squared up so I could draw my bow and have a squared up shot toward him so I knew it was my mistake and he was done and it's early in the morning so then you got to wait it out you want to think that they're going to come back and you might have a chance and sometimes that does happen but it's often the case that they're with a hot doe if they're going to move back through the area they're going to be singled out with a doe and come by with her rather than come by on their own after they've noticed something's wrong so the rest of the season kind of plays out slow not a lot happening and I was pretty much only hunting weekends and I had coming up to rifle season we primarily hunt with a bow but during the past previous four years of college I would made some acquaintances and I had a couple buddies and one of them had started out hunting with a few of us and we got him started, I think we started with, with archery first. And so he'd come up to the farm with me occasionally. But then we picked up the guns as well to hit rifle season. And as rifle season rolled around, we were going to plan to have a weekend or two of rifle hunting as well. And so Nick made plans to join me one particular weekend. And we got together and hit the woods. Now I was using my dad's Model 70 Winchester and at that point I think, I can't remember what I actually took to the stand that morning. I think it was his 270 because I think Nick was using the 30-06. Normally I would be using the 30-06 because dad uses the 270. Dad wasn't going to go hunting that morning. So I think I elected to take the 270 and Nick would take the 30 out 6. We'd both go down into this same general area where I'd had the encounter with this old deer. I would sit on the same stand that I was sitting on, the short stand right by Deer Canyon. And Nick was going to sit about 150 yards or so, maybe a little further, down in the creek bottom. So he'd be to the northwest of where I was. Basically, we'd both have our backs to each other the way those stands were set up and he would hopefully encounter a deer crossing from the north to the south side of the creek heading toward me and I would possibly encounter the opposite something heading from the south or east over towards his direction and we'd be able to cover basically both directions because our backs were toward each other but offset by that 100 150 yards well, there was a, kind of that dead area between us with our backs toward each other. And that happens to be an edge of, of the CRP field or CRP pasture. 
where it runs north and south. Right after daybreak, something, you know, I'm always just, I feel like my eyes work better as a sense than anything else. And you try to listen for everything, but you can't always hear. And so I really rely on my eyes and that gets me in trouble because my head, I have to move my head, but I try to do it slowly and in small increments so that I can scan the entire area without getting too ambitious, I guess, and moving too abruptly. Well, something caused me to look over my left shoulder right after daybreak along that field edge and I caught a glimpse of a deer moving along where the timber meets that CRP pasture, that open grass field. And that's common as well, so that's something to look for, those edge trails where they move along. So I caught movement, and immediately I get up and turn facing the tree. At that point, I would be directly facing Nick. So I knew there wasn't anything I could do, but as, as this deer moved up the edge and got directly behind me, I would have a clear shot and a safe shot and away from Nick so I didn't have to worry about that at that point so I was going to wait till this deer crossed behind my stand if he followed the same path he was on and then I would have a clear shot. As he got a little bit closer and began to pass behind me I recognized that this was that old white faced buck with the droopy uh, main beam. So, of course, I get the gun up, level on him, and it had to be a really quick shot. He wasn't very far away. He was probably within bow range, actually, when I shot, 40 to 45 yards directly behind me. But that didn't matter at that point. The gun is what I had, and I was going to take a quick shot at him. So I made sure to get a good level shot. I didn't try to stop him. I didn't want to spook him. So being that close, I was confident. I could make a good shot. Leveled on his shoulder and snuck off a shot. He immediately bolted and I felt like it was a good shot, especially being that close, but I wanted to go ahead and get a second shot in him before he crossed the fence because then he would get into the thick cedar trees and if it was a marginal shot and we had to blood trail him, wasn't sure that that would go particularly well. So went ahead and put another round in the bolt action rifle leveled on him again before he crossed the cre uh, crossed the fence rather and put another shot in him he did end up making it across the fence so then you get down from the stand and I met up with Nick actually I'm pretty sure I immediately called Darren from the tree stand and admittedly I hadn't put all the pieces together I thought his droopy beam was a drop tine all along so I thought he had a drop tine and had broken the end of his beam in the picture you can kind of tell or if you're looking at him you can kind of tell why I might have thought that because it's very squared off where that beam droops down at a right angle so I thought he had a drop tine and it busted the tip of his beam off all and that's what I thought all along so I called Darren it was early in the morning and I told him hey I got a, a drop tine buck and so I had a quick conversation with him and then Nick and I got out of the stand he was wondering what was going on and we met up to recover the buck we walk up to him and then I recognize of course that this was the deer from earlier in the season and I'm very 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 pleased to have caught up with him not by any of my own wit or strategy just lucked out he was being very sneaky. You could see in his mannerisms as he walked behind me. He was very, very methodical about how he moved around the area. I just happened to catch him on a bad day and got the better of him. So we did everything that we needed to do, cleaned him up, got him all dressed out, got him home. And we took him to a local locker plant, and I was... At that time, it was the biggest deer that I think any of us had shot off the farm. We're fairly picky. Not anymore. We've kind of opened up. But we passed a lot of deer. Not necessarily passing real big deer, but we recognized the fact that younger deer would mature to be really phenomenal 
and not that we took any of those great deer but we passed a lot a lot of our early years of hunting were passing bucks buck after buck so this was a bigger deer and very old when we took him to the locker plant I elected to go ahead and have them cape him out for me and keep his cape and we would consider the possibility of having him mounted later on and we did elect to do that so as I mentioned this deer we actually had or I had some prior encounters with and a prior story with it goes back about three years prior it was a similar scenario so at that point I was in college had hunted all archery season and Nick and I had hunted some together and had no luck and I went out during rifle season on my own to see if I could catch up with a deer and I wasn't going to be too particular on that day but as a similar scenario I was in the very same area just down in the creek bottom I believe it was before we moved that short stand up to the current location it was up against a big honey locust tree and I could see to the north through the trees into the creek bottom and up onto the hill so a similar setting but just down into the creek bottom more of a flat area during rifle season it was cold and early in the morning a buck was moving in to my north through some hardwood timber and it's a lot of oh there's a few really mature hackberry and locust trees and some walnut in that bottom but a lot of spindly hackberry that's growing up underneath those canopies and so it's open but you have some obstacles to look through well I saw a deer coming through and I got the binoculars on him and I could see that he had at least one split G2 at the top that was forked I thought, well that's interesting that's and decently long tines but he was walking perpendicular to me so I couldn't see his spread I could just see longer tines and that split I thought well that's good enough for me looks like a decent deer so I switched the binoculars for the rifle leveled on him when he got to a gap and he was probably 80 to 100 yards across this bottom easy shot with a rifle so I get settled on him and take a shot and I don't know if I wasn't settled completely on him or what the case might be I wasn't resting on a rest I had it had the gun on my hand up next to the tree so I tried to steady myself as good as I could but I didn't feel 100% confident in the shot a lot of times you'll see a deer drop within eyesight with a rifle and I didn't see that I saw him run off to the east and he got to the creek and looked like he crossed the creek and from there I wasn't sure so I took a little time and decided well I'll go see what the shot was all about so I walked over to where he was standing when I took the shot and didn't really see any blood at that point but I could make out approximately where he ran at least in the direction of the creek and so I took off in that direction but once I hit the creek and he crossed then he was on a trail and I couldn't pick up his tracks anymore but I thought well if he is wounded a lot of times they stick to water and follow this creek and it was in a general easterly direction so I thought well I'll, I'll just follow this creek check out the creek bottom kind of slowly make my way over to the east fit property fence and then I'll head north to the road and walk back home and pout so I walked very slowly along the creek bottom didn't see anything I found got to the east property line barbed wire fence and turned north and started walking slowly along that as well just thought well probably not gonna find this deer but we'll just make our way back to the road well I get to another cross pasture fence one that runs east and west and it's a kind of a flat bottom right along the creek with some open timber similar to where he was when I shot 
but about, I'd say, a quarter mile to the east. And it's an area where deer often bed, so I was being pretty slow. Didn't want to bump anything out of there, but I needed to go through that area to get back to where I wanted to be. And I did end up bumping a deer, and lo and behold, I recognized that it was the deer I shot at. I thought, oh, well, if he's bedded up that close, I might have got a good shot at him. I might have injured him. And he did move up pretty well, so I didn't have complete confidence that I would recover him, but I needed to pursue him. So made my way up to where he was bedded, and I did find a little tiny bit of blood, but it was nothing near what you would find for a lethal wound. Thought, well, he's up on his feet. That little bit of blood, I must have just grazed him. Probably not going to find this deer, but I did slowly make my way back to the road and then head west toward the house. Well, that was my last encounter with him that year. Didn't have any luck the rest of the season. But the following spring, we often go out shed hunting. And it's common for us to be looking for sheds and checking pasture fence and all sorts of activities out around the farm, covering a lot of ground. And it would have been kind of late spring, not quite to summertime yet. I was in our west pasture, so it would have been about three quarters of a mile west of where I'd shot this buck, shot at this buck. And I was walking through the pasture, down along the creek bottom, and I noticed a deer bedded up kind of behind this little rolling knob along the creek. So it's not quite to where two creeks intersect. But getting there, so there's a lot of undulations kind of up and downs in that creek bottom. And there was a deer bedded up right behind this little knob. Down in some thick sumac. Under, basically there's some cedar trees that create a canopy along the creek. And then in this clearing, there's a lot of sumac, which creates a nice thick canopy. So this deer was right down in there. And I could tell it was a buck because he had began to grow his little velvet horns. You could just see the knobs on top of his skull. But he's just bedded stock still. I thought, well, that's really odd for me to be this close. And at that point, I was probably 40 yards away from him. And I just began to creep a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. He did have his head up, so he was aware. And I wasn't really thinking, like, chronic wasting or anything like that at EHD. I didn't even really know about those things or the particulars about them anyway. So I, that was out of my mind. I thought, well, this is, this is interesting. So I kind of crept up toward him, and I, find, I was probably within inside of 10 yards from him when he finally got up and moved and when he moved I could see his right front leg was swollen completely from the foot to the shoulder huge infection and he was very uncomfortable moving very slow and he kind of worked off away from me to the southeast and across the other little creek and out of sight very slow and I felt awful you know I thought, shoot that deer is miserable well again I didn't put two and two together until a little bit later on I was walking the fence looking for sheds and there in that general area I found a shed that matched up to the deer I had shot at during rifle season at the fork on that G2 just exactly like the deer I had shot at so then I put the pieces together. That was the deer he was dragging the result of my wound. He was all infected, and, and I didn't think he was going to make it at all. But I had the shed from him, and that was kind of cool. And just chalked it up to probably a dead deer. You know, we'd find his carcass later on if he stays on our property. But it was kind of nice to know that he was finding safety there on our property. And he had everything he needed. There were crop fields close by. He had water right there at the creek. Plenty of shelter and protection. So there was a chance for him to survive if nature was on his side. 
Well, the year passes, no more history with that deer. The following year, again, I don't remember how the deer season went. I'll have to go back and look. But springtime, we're back out looking for sheds, walking that exact same fence, and there I find another shed, this time a little bit bigger, but the exact same deer. And so I was encouraged. I thought, oh, he made it again this year. So he survived, must have made it past his wound, and he's off and running. Well, no experiences with that deer that year until I saw him as that old white-faced buck. Now, after I got this deer on the ground and had him back in my hands, I took those sheds, and I, again, hadn't added up all the pieces 100%, but I had these two years of sheds with him, seen him on the hoof when I had him in rifle season when I wounded him, and now I had taken him, and I put all those sheds, and he's an exact match to those sets of sheds. I think I have one complete set of his sheds, if not two, and then now I have his shoulder mount. So that was a pretty neat experience and fun to put all the pieces together after the fact and have this deer that's so recognizable have a few encounters with him and such a really neat experience. I'm glad that I had closure on that story. It's an awful feeling to have wounded an animal and put them through it. So it's kind of nice that I was able to go ahead and take that deer eventually. Now we're working on becoming better hunters and having that kind of experience patterning deer and having some history with them before we hunt them. So far, no luck. We've really not been able to put those patterns together, but hopefully one day we'll be able to spend the time and have the opportunity to do that. But it's really interesting to go back and look at pictures or identify these deer after you take them and, and realize who they were that you have some experience with them so a really neat hunt really unique deer really old deer and i'm very proud to have him on the wall